You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We return today with something new. Snick, by the British author Paul Draper, writer of the dark fiction collection Blackgate Tales. As Draper describes it, a postgraduate biologist discovers a hidden monstrosity during summer research on the Heathland near his family home. We're all about hidden monstrosities here at Horror Babble. You'll be hearing more from Paul in the coming months, so be sure to check out his fantastic anthology in the meantime. Link in the video description. We hope you enjoy this one. Snick by Paul Draper I drove past Tolmere Heath again last week. From the road, one sees little more than a few scrubs of gorse. They're yellow-flowered in spring, and peek above the ancient anti-tank blocks which now loll at odd angles like stone tortoises. It could be someone's unrestricted back garden. You wouldn't know from a car. Walkers know this place, though, whether they're dog strollers or amblers. It continues to be popular, despite several unexplained disappearances down the years, about which the locals have some myths. The heath stretches from the golf club pavilion in the north, across an area of about fifteen square miles. Its eastern perimeter is the Hot Rod Stadium car park, where every Sunday punters come from across town to breathe in gasoline and eat hot dogs covered with dust. Farther south is the estate where I grew up, and where my parents still live. I will never set foot on the heath again, for any length of time. My love of the heath began as a child. After all, I am now a biologist of no little repute, and those formative years clanking my little bicycle around the impacted dirt paths and stony lanes of Tolmere filled me with a lasting love of nature. My parents' house is close to the heath, only a fifteen-yard step to a bracken-gated pathway. Beyond consists mainly of scrub and stage-two heathland habitat. My memories of summer in the eighties are filled with butterflies and dragonflies, soft silk webs across leaves, and the startled bounding of spooked squirrels. Although foxes mainly roamed near the refuse bins on the estate, they established their dens here, and on a lucky day you might catch a pair of jewelled eyes studying you from deep within a hedge. The main expanse of the old golf course on the heath was laced with pathways, some hidden, some obvious. Curious places dotted the centre, a bicycle track, well before the BMX phenomenon, tree-studded banks littered with strange fey hummocks, and a place we called the Maze. The Maze was the social epicentre of my fellow bike-obsessed childhood friends. We had no idea of its origin, but the result was a lattice of scrub-lined corridors covering a square kilometre, with the same bewildering, disorientating effect of any handcrafted maze you might find at a stately home. We would congregate there on the summer weekends, split into loose teams, and create arcane but exciting games with scoring systems that would have been unfathomable to anyone older. We hurtled around the high-hedged pathways, sometimes passing one another, often colliding, but always having a blast. The expert maze riders would know when to hold their handlebars in the centre rather than by the grips, lest gorse needles porcupine their sore fingers at the end of an action-filled day. In time, we all grew up. Some friends moved away, others started seeing partners, and the maze fell silent. In later years, 
I would return with my notepad and camera and explore the habitat differently. I wrote my PhD on the entomology of the heath, focusing on the rare butterfly species, and my wonder at the interconnectedness of the place only deepened. However, one area I could never fully study was the maze. It seemed simple enough, but in places the thicket was so prohibitively dense that I could only speculate about the scurrying, fluttering, and scampering going on within. I could study the paths and the outer layer of shrubs and plants, but in mapping the space out with a trisect and compass, a core patch of about fifty square yards was inaccessible. It left me with a conundrum. The heath was officially owned by the sniffy golf course, who automatically turned down any request for alteration of their grounds. No one ever really came to the maze, as it was away from the main pathways. With my peer generation all grown up, an electronic spell had fallen upon the local youth. These days, races and competitions were more commonplace behind the console-glowed lounge curtains of the estate than out there on the dirt tracks. I rationalized that I could explore my way into the core of the maze a little. Not enough to spoil an ancient habitat, but just enough to gain a narrow corridor of access to study the life within. So, one summer on my return from studying at university, this is what I did, together with Jackie. Jackie. I imagine to many others I came across as a geek, and I admit to showing little interest in ghouls, even during my freshers year. Jackie was different. For a start, she was a brilliant botanist. She understood all the phases of plant growth, particularly deciduous woodland and heathland, and showed a rare aptitude for linking the fundamentals of zoology to the success of plant species. Some jocks and goons in my year joked that she wasn't a looker, with her mousy hair and pale face. To me, she was enchanting. We shared coffee and chats late into the night in the university library. Before long, we were dating, when it uh, didn't clash with our studies. Jackie was at odds with her family, and so she asked if she could visit me over that summer at my parents' home. My mother said yes, delighted that I had found someone, and she charmed them from the off. I was happy she was with me, not only for company, but to help with the study of the maze I planned to undertake in those weeks. Her science skills would be invaluable. The most important thing, I said, as we approached it for the first time, is to leave it all as it should be. We can cut through only so far as we need to, make notes and take photographs, but we shouldn't collect. Jackie was of the same frame of mind as me. Habitat should be sacrosanct, and animals, be they bird, insect, or worm, must be allowed to carry on as nature intended. This was the glory of life. Observation and recording should define zoology, not collection and pickling. In time, we had incised a tract of about ten feet into the heart of the maze. Keeping low, we had worked in shifts, creating a mini-tunnel that pushed beyond the first few rows of bushes. Progress had already thrown up some interesting discoveries, with layers of silkworm evidenced, and some fascinating ant colony excavations clear on the arid topsoil. During my second rest, Jackie gave a little cry of excitement. I put down my flask of tea. Look at this, she said, backing out of the clipped passage, hair must by branches. I went back in. Several large webs spanned multiple plant roots. They had the classic structure of garden spider webs, a sort of crowning, spiraling neatness, but were larger than I had previously seen. One web, clearly a single structure, was nearly two feet across. Look at the parceling said Jackie behind me. The light was low here, as the gentle summer sun filtered through the layers of needles above. 
I saw what she meant. Most web spiders have a habit of injecting their prey with venom to pacify them, and then they spin a cocoon-like shroud around the immobile victim to preserve them for later feasting. Several large flies were trussed up in this manner, but where normally you could see the whole insect parceled intact, each of these large flies was limbless. At that moment a frenetic buzzing sounded by my right ear, and, turning, I witnessed a freshly caught green bottle trapped and thrashing desperately upon one web. And there, forward crept the mistress. She was beautiful, and larger than any spider I had previously seen on the heath. Her brown body was solid and fat, and culminated in the tapering hourglass shape of a typical British garden spider. Her legs, however, were more like that of a house spider, thick and hairy. I held up a pen, and measured her at about four inches, front leg to back. Her approach dwarfed the large fly. "'What's happening?' Jackie called. I shushed her. "'I'll tell you in a moment,' I whispered, wanting to witness this ritual in its entirety. Forward edged the spider. I had expected her to grab the fly with the ends of her legs, circle to the thorax, and deliver a venomous bite, much as this class usually does. However, she surprised me. She reached out a single leg, and patted the fly on one of its compound eyes. This prompted the insect to thrash with greater urgency, as it sensed the mortal danger. The spider then reached forward to trace the underside of the thorax, and then, with her scything mandibles flexing, snick, bit off a leg. I had never seen such behaviour. I watched with a thrilled scientific fascination, as this beautiful creature did her work. She moved around her hapless victim, and severed each limb in turn, then moved to the wings, and— with an almost imperceptible snick, removed those too. Before long, the fly was just an inert tube of dwindling life, mouthpiece twitching spasmodically, but no other means of movement possible. The spider then cast a light, lacy web about this ghastly banquet. Nothing stronger was needed, before she crept back to her concealed resting place. Upon exiting the tunnel, my description of this curious encounter tumbled out. Jackie crept in, and confirmed things as I had seen them. The day was drawing on, but we planned to come back each day for the rest of the week, and finish our studies. It would make for a superb summer research essay. I already imagined the praise from my tutor. The rest of the week was exhausting, but happy. My parents, sixties night owls by nature, kept us occupied until the small hours after dinner. But by morning light, we were back down at the maze, extending the tunnel to see what more we could find. Our last visit on the Friday uncovered a great surprise. At the very centre of the maze, the ground sloped away. It was hard to see completely from my cramped position, working with the shears, but what looked like a very large rabbit hole seemed to lie beyond the final few tiers of foliage. At first I thought it was darker soil, but no, it was a hole. The next few hours revealed that the pit was larger than I had first thought. The mouth of it was in fact nearly eight feet across. Did the gorse take hold farther inside it? I hacked away at the thick roots until exhausted, then handed over to Jackie. I retreated to our station, and took a minute to lie back and regain my energy. All around me were the sounds of an English heathland summer. Blackbirds gently sank from the trees, and overhead a little single-engine plane buzzed its lazy way across a cerulean sky. The only other sound was the soft slicing of shears on roots as 
Jackie carried on with our work. I looked up at the single cloud visible in the sky, and, ebbing with fatigue, imagined shapes. It was a boat. No, a whale. Maybe a rocket. Perhaps ten minutes passed, maybe thirty, before I opened my eyes. A softness behind my eyes told me I'd briefly nodded off, as the week's exertions took their toll on my less-than-athletic body. There was a blackbird still, with its sweet whistle. The plane had passed, and the day seemed quieter. "'How are you getting on?' I called, to which there was no reply. The light was dimmer, as the sun was now low on the horizon. I picked up our cheap electric torch and entered the little study tunnel, which by now was about twenty yards long. As I reached the end, I saw that Jackie had finished the last cutting, and had reached the hole. Peering over the side, I couldn't see the bottom. The sunlight, struggling as it did to penetrate this far into the thicket, stopped about a foot or two into the pit. I shone the torch down. It was deeper than I had imagined, with root-laced sides. The torchlight glinted off something that had to have been a full thirty feet down. Jackie? Was she injured? Had she fallen and knocked herself out? I climbed down, using roots to hold and step on. On reaching the bottom, I saw that the metallic object was the pair of shears. The soil they lay on was soft and cold to the touch. The air had a sweet, sappy smell. I turned around a full three hundred and sixty degrees, and saw that the pit continued eastwards via a tunnel. Snick! There was also another indistinct sound from that direction. A voice? A light, electric current passed over my skin. I crouched, and entered the mouth of the tunnel, which was just lower than my standing height. Snick! Louder now! The tunnel broadened. The background sound grew louder, but undulated, like the lowing of a cow far away. I passed into a chamber— the ceiling maintained more or less the same height as before, but the floor dropped away into a larger room-like cavity. My cheap torch strained to pick out the walls. Snick! The sound came from within this space. A sob. The background sound was a moan, with a grotesque, fleshy thump, a disembodied forearm dropped into the beam of the torch. I dropped it with a startled cry, and it went out. A muffled scream, a loud tapping. I scrambled to pick the torch up. At first, the button didn't work, but with a couple of shakes it flickered back into life. I thrust it towards the wall. Jackie was fixed to the surface by what looked like thick strands of glutinous rope her face pinned against the wall. Hunched over her was an enormous arachnid shape, fully ten feet across, mandibles curved like sabres. Its legs tapped around Jackie's frame, as her remaining leg pushed weakly against the webbing. Below, at the base of the wall, two arms and the other leg lay on the floor. Snick! Its final... Horrific operation completed, I watched, repulsed, as the creature spun a light net of silk across Jackie's blonde hair. She turned her head slightly, and I caught the fading, insane glint of her left eye as the webbing covered it over. I scrambled away and fled, screaming, by the time I reached home, I knew that Jackie was dead. My parents were away that weekend, and it left me alone with my shock and terror. While I showered, anguished, practical thoughts competed with my trauma. What should I do? 
This was without doubt a discovery of immense value, but who would believe it? And if they did, what would happen? So often clumsy discoveries prove ruinous to species. For me it was always all about studying, not collection. What right did I have to bring disruption to this astonishing animal? I cut the Gordian knot with a blade of pragmatism. The story was that Jackie had gone home. When the police eventually called, they found no sign that this wasn't true. Her parents said she had been unhappy at home, and after a few years the case was finally closed. They interviewed me a few times, but I had nothing further to add. They assumed that Jackie had just upped sticks and moved abroad. Occasionally I visit my parents, but I no longer go to the heath. At night, once the larks have finished their daily exertions, only the odd screech of a tawny owl carries across the bush-tops to the spare room where I lie. Sometimes I figure I might just hear a short, soft sound carried on the night air. Snick. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.